Good evening for those who are joining us right now. Uh, as you can see, the, the audience has increased. Uh, this uh, last part of the program was organized with the collaboration of the Greenwich Village Society for Historical Preservation. And we have many uh, members of the society here for the occasion. We're very happy to have Mimi Sheraton as our keynote speaker, but we've decided to do it in a more informal way in forms of conversation. So I will introduce Karen Lowe, who is gonna uh, lead the conversation with Mimi, and then she will introduce Mimi also, even if, I mean, I, she doesn't really need an, an introduction, but. So Karen is an urbanist and a journalist. Um, she is the director of the East Village and special projects at the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation. And she has worked on the concept and the idea of restaurant preservation with many experts, including uh, Mimi. We have a feedback problem. Okay, thank you. Um, she was the editor of the online public policy journal City Limits and associate editor at the Forward, reported at the Tennessean, and so on and so forth. So great experience as a writer, but also uh, very much an expert in urban issues, restaurant and food. Karen, please. Thank you, Fabio. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here as part of this wonderful conference. And it's our great pleasure to hear from Mimi Sheraton this afternoon. Mimi is one of America's, and indeed the world's, foremost experts on food. From restaurants to recipes, folkways to foodstuffs, grand and humble, familiar and exotic, but always with an insistence on deliciousness. In her six decades of writing about food, she has been a pioneer, the first female main restaurant critic at the New York Times. She has been prolific, writing 16 books of recipes, journalism, and mem memoir. Most recently, of course, 1,000 Foods to Eat Before You Die, which she will happily sign for you after the program. If you buy it. If you buy it. <laughs> <laughs> and she has been authoritative, inspiring both peers and readers with her diligence as a reporter, confidence as a tastemaker, skill as a home cook, and of course, her lovely way with words. Mimi grew up in Brooklyn with a father who sold produce and a mother who really knew how to cook. She was always interested in food. Professionally, she first became an interior designer and wrote about furnishings for magazines like Seventeen and House Beautiful. But her writing and travels began to focus more and more on food. Thankfully for us, the many magazines that have published her work, and of course, the culinary bookshelf. Importantly, here at the New School, Mimi is very much a villager. She attended another university nearby <laughs> and has lived in the neighborhood for seven decades. To get here, she in fact just had to come down 12th Street. As we discuss Gotham on a plate, we must also touch on the unique role of the village's markets and cafes. So much has changed. The role of the critic, the role of the home cook, the role of the restaurant. So let's get started. Mimi, in your new book, in the introduction, you write, the world of food has never been as exciting as it is now. Why? I think uh, the interest in developing new foods, the availability of so many ingredients that we didn't have before, and the sort of global searching that chefs and restaurateurs do to pique our interest and to bring us things we didn't know about before. I also think uh, the media is an enormous help for spreading the word. And um, the result is that we have a much richer larder, a much more diverse menu uh, to choose from. And when I was writing A Thousand Foods to Eat Before You Die, which was based so much on 60 years of research and lots of travel, I tried very much to have a global balance to, to represent countries whose cuisines I think 
are very up and coming on the fashion scene, most especially, I think, West Africa. In the next two or three years, we will hear a great deal about it entering the fusion scene. I noticed uh, that the section on Africa, I think, is about as long as any other. Um, the book is incredible. It uh, takes you from everything, from things you know, empanadas, chicken soup, um, to things you have never heard of. And um, I confess some things that I can die without eating, like jellied <laughs> eel. Um, <laughs> but um, so Africa, uh, tell us about that. What's going to happen next with menus and African influences? Well, some of the West African restaurants in Harlem serving Senegalese food, for example, uh, although the ingredients are different and the spices are different, the look is very much like Louisiana cooking. Mm. I think anybody who eats jambalaya would have no trouble eating some of the fish and um, meat stews they, they see up there, which should be no big surprise because it was the slaves from West Africa who were taken to Louisiana, became the cooks, and brought with them, of course, among many other things, the okra that they called gumbo. So I think there is a sort of kissing cousin um, familiarity, and since everyone is looking for new influence, new food words, I think words like chicken yaffa and jollof rice and a bunch of other things are pretty soon going to make it. I, I would like to say something you said in the introduction. I did flesh out my education at the other place downtown here. I took a number of literature and philosophy courses, oh. Sydney Hook, Albert Lenbro, they had a, quite a, uh, a staff at that time. Let, so. let that be noted. <laughs> Excellent. Um, now, with um, speaking of words, the new words that we're going to be seeing on menus, um, I dine out a fair amount here in New York City, like uh, most of us with unbearably small kitchens. Um, and I don't know how to feel. I'm a little embarrassed at how often I have to ask what words mean on a menu. <laughs> I feel like it's a vocabulary test. I guess you don't have that problem. I, now and then. Now I, I yeah. saw, I think I saw something last night I didn't understand. And I was at mm. Blue Hill, which was fabulous. He's doing a whole bunch of new vegetable things, some of which I didn't recognize. So uh, especially, um, well, even this morning, I had breakfast at Cafe Clooney and I had French toast and there were berries and then there was something that sort of looked like an apple but it didn't taste like an apple. It was raw rhubarb and it was absolutely delicious but I did have to ask what it was. I didn't recognize it in little celery sort of slices. So that, that's the thing, food is, it's an endless subject and there are always more things to be learned about one facet or another. Something that is uh, distinctive about Mimi as a critic and as a writer is the depth of her erudition. Um, in addition to studying in, at at least two universities in New York City, um, you have studied at fine cooking schools in different locations around the world. Obviously, you're incredibly well-read and ridiculously well-traveled. I don't know if there's anywhere you haven't been. Um, so tell us about that. It, it obviously has made you who you are. But so many people writing about food today, I don't think, have that experience. Well, they may not have anyone else to finance the travel. I think that's a very important feature that uh, could happen in my day if you were well known and if you worked for the right publications. I suspect now that they are pulling in their horns economically as far as sending people all over. Um, I think I, I see in travel articles, for example, many more articles by people who live in a place rather than being sent by the magazine or publication. So that, that's a handicap. But I used to plan some, quite often in fact, not just sometimes, food articles that would take me to the place I wanted to go. I, I once worked for a man who accused me of being someone who seems to be doing one thing, but is really doing something else. <laughs> and that was true. I mean, I can remember when I wanted to go to southern Spain, and I was at the Times, and I suggested an article on capers, on growing and, and processing capers, and they thought that was a great idea, but they had to send me to southern Spain. 
to do it. So that was, and then I worked after I left the Times, for which I traveled a great deal and had before, for the Condé Nast Traveler for five years. So that was all traveling all the time, all around the United States mostly, but also to, you know, two or three times a year someplace abroad. Let's see, so much to talk about. Um, how about a, a trend these days in the New York City dining world that you like a lot? Well, I love the new cooking. I love the, the fusion of ingredients, and I like very much uh, the way vegetables are being prepared now. Now that uh, there's so much emphasis on eating vegetables, so many vegetarians, chefs are beginning to give vegetables a certain heft uh, that would suggest what in the trade is known as mouthfeel of meat. Uh, beets, carrots, and parsnips particularly. Uh, I guess in the last week I've been to three sort of hot new restaurants that all began with glazed baby carrots. You have to name them, the restaurants. <laughs> there was Narcissa and Upland and last night at Blue Hill, that's not a new restaurant. Now, at Blue Hill, did, there's the um, recycled cuisine. No, it wasn't the garbage menu okay. last night. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did you have the garbage menu at any point? No, I okay. didn't. Okay. Uh, so, so they all had, did you say glazed carrots? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Uh, at Blue Hill, they were sort of raw, but they had a kind of oily, lemony okay. coating on them. And what's a trend that you loathe? Kale. <laughs> Do we have any fans of kale here? I hate it. And <laughs> Do, have you always hated it? But when, when I was growing up, kale was a winter vegetable, and it was the only thing left outdoors at greengrocers. You know, they would take everything in because it was cold. And it was believed that kale is not good until it freezes once. And that freezing would tenderize it because when you freeze, you break open the cells and then when you cook it, it gets much softer. And kale was always cooked soft and always with some kind of oil or fat. If it were Italian, it would be smothered with garlic and olive oil. If it were in the deep south, it would be cooked with ham hocks. If it were in Chi Chinese cooking, it would be similar to the Italian, but with a different oil and seasonings, and always soft. And what they're doing now with it hard, or God forbid raw, or toasted kale chips, kale Caesar salad, I, I really don't like at all. But I think, I think the celeries are coming up. Not only stalk celery and knob celery, but a new one to look for called Celtus, which is also known as lettuce celery, and it's a very long root, something like knob celery in, in its brownish covering, but with very big lettuce leaves growing out of the top. I had it at Alder on 2nd Avenue, and I'm beginning to read about it, so keep an eye out for it. And last night uh, at Blue Hill, they had a celery root that was kind of um, sautéed. It was almost like a celery root schnitzel. So stay tuned. Uh, let's see. Um, so with all of this, the new ingredients were, as we talked about vocabulary words, learning about um, ingredients we've never met before. Um, talk about the, the provisioning, the farming, the uh, uh, supply chain, as it were. You know, how are we getting all this new stuff that we've never even heard of before? Is well, some is imported and some has become, I think fortunately, the production of boutique farms near cities and sources. <clears throat> and it's given um, new work, new, new forms of income to boutique farmers. So I think that has been very good. And also, it's stocked our green markets. I think. The, the green markets, particularly New York, California, and so on, uh, have brought many, many things to the public and to restaurants that we didn't have before. I am not basically a locovore, although I would say two-thirds to three-quarters of what I eat is local, especially in summer when the green markets are so full. But I tend to like whatever is the best if I can get it. And though most of the summer I'm happy with peaches from Pennsylvania or New Jersey, 
At least twice during the season, I order Freestone Georgia peaches from Hale Groves down in Florida, and I order their white grapefruits once or twice during the winter. It's very hard to find white grapefruit in markets. They're almost always pink, and I prefer them white. So I really like a little exotica from far away, and the best uh, that I can get. Speaking of the best, you are, Mimi could talk for hours just about market, local markets, about Citarella and Balducci's and Dean and DeLuca and on and on. Tell us about getting the best around here in the village. Uh, this is a pretty good place to get the best, right? Yeah, um, I think in some ways it used to be a little better. I think nothing has matched Balducci for vegetables, although they've been that matched for many other things, except when the green markets are open. Uh, there's one near me on Abingdon Square on Saturday, <coughs> excuse me, and then of course Union Square four days a week. But um, we have many other things, Citarella with the fish, Florence Meat Market with the meat, all the bread baking, and so on. And I, I can remember when the only lettuce you would see in most stores was you would see uh, iceberg and you would see Boston lettuce. But unless you were in an Italian neighborhood where they would have romaine and maybe even rugolo way back, um, you just didn't see it in most markets. And the only mushrooms you saw were champignon. And now, of course, every market has six, eight, ten different kinds of mushrooms. Not always in good condition, but they have them. So I think the, the press and mass communication has brought all of that to the attention of people, as have competitive, inventive chefs who try to outdo each other on their menus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are an incredibly accomplished cook. Um, from what I read, I haven't had the privilege of tasting it yet. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe one day. So, you, you know how to make the classics, new things, you name it. I'm guessing you can make it. What with our obsession with uh, ingredients these days, these beautiful exotic vegetables, et cetera, et cetera, I almost think that um, someone like me could maybe get away with assembling you know, the most gorgeous plate of exotic vegetables dressed just so, and that's as good as uh, making a, the perfect beef wellington or coca van or what have you. What's going on with that these days? Well, the I think simple perfection is the prize, and it's not easy to achieve because there's usually no margin for error when, when you're doing something like that. I have noticed, we talked about this a little, a huge change, change in floor space and what it's being um, given over to in almost all food markets these days. I see more and more prepared foods in various stages of preparation. Uh, Dean and DeLuca, when they opened on Broadway and Prince, had a magnificent fish department. It was huge, it was stupendous, they had all kinds of varieties. A few years later, I went in, tiny little counter over on the side. Instead, they had cooked things, seasoned things, sushi. Citarella, here in, just here in the village, is giving more and more space over to pre-sliced, packaged, uh, cut up, all the vegetables cut up, then you can get them cooked, then you can get them seasoned, you can get them weighed out to you at the deli counter, but you can pick them up already wrapped at another counter. And I think there's more and more of a trend first in uh, New Yorkers at least using the prepared foods, but on the part of the markets, getting rid of personnel and cutting down the amount of time it takes to wait on a customer. I remember speaking to Andy Balducci many years ago. They had a, a marvelous uh, delicatessen salumeria department. And I said, I bet you make a fortune on that. He says, it's our lowest profit center because of the time it takes to wait on a customer. So that's why now Citarella has closed down the slicing of smoked salmon, that whole smoked fish department they used to have. They still have one or two laying around and they'll slice them for you, but they would prefer that you pick up the sliced packages. And it seems to work for the customers too. Yeah, it's interesting because my assumption had been that 
that was done for time pressed folks, shoppers, but the driver is as much yeah, or well, more. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the two uh, interests coincide, the store's profit and what the customer wants, and uh, that's gradually what happens. And yet there's an impression of freshness because the fish department is still there, the vegetable department is still there, and they can channel all of that into the prepared foods. Right, right. So, What do you think about Whole Foods in New York City? Uh, I think it's a very good market. It's very confusing to me. Uh, it's so big and so spread out, and I'm not a regular shopper in Whole Foods, so I'm a little dazzled, and I'm not crazy about the ones where things are on different floors. I don't like to go down to go shopping, so uh, I feel, what am I doing in this basement just for a box of Wheatina, you know, if you can even find Wheatina. But, you know, they have such an array that a lot of it is bound to be good. Uh, I enjoy the one on 6th Avenue and about 26th Street. That's a more pleasant one to shop. And the one at Time Warner Center is kind of fun, mm -hmm. and you can pick something up and eat it there. But big sprawls like that, like Trader Joe, it's just too bewildering. That was my me. next question, if you've ever... Waited on the line at Trader yeah, Joe's. Yeah, I, you know, I try everything once, yeah. and uh, yeah. also they're not close enough to me. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I'm closer to D'Agostino, Gourmet Garage, Citarella, and so I do so much of it Saturday and other days at the green markets, right, right. and so, and I use a custom butcher Florence meat market that cuts all the meat when you order it, so I don't pick up meat in the markets either. Um, now, you've been writing, being published for many decades. Uh, the media world has changed so much, and you seem fine with that. Maybe tweets, among other things. <laughs> and, um, you know, despite the fact that, um, you know, everybody can be a food critic now um, without your background, you, you seem untroubled. Tell us about that. Well, first of all, I don't think there's anything you can do about it. It's not going to stop. So you might as well learn to live with it and separate the good from the bad. I never pay any attention to consumer survey places. Yelp, Urban Spoon, I'm not even crazy about Zagat, except for the addresses and the phone numbers. <laughs> and finding are, are they out what's in a given neighborhood if I'm going, you know, and say, well, you know, where, where might we eat here? Uh, and now in the later Zagat, they've even taken away the streets from the index. So although they tell you what neighborhood is in, they no longer tell you what street it's on, which I think was a great loss. Take, but, take but note, you have, Tim and Nina. You have to learn to separate and, and know. And uh, I think the uh, consumer uh, surveys have a great danger because obviously a restaurateur or market can orchestrate a response and even with Zagat, there's no proof that you've really been to a restaurant. As far as I know, they never ask to see a copy of a receipt or anything. So, uh, But the more there's out there about food, the better. The more people learn about it, the more people become interested. And, and that can't hurt. Um, what are your must-reads? Must-reads? Yes. Well, I mean, I like to see what the local New York press is doing. I always look at what New York Magazine is reviewing, not only restaurants, but I especially like Robin Robin. Uh, I like the way they cover things. I like what they cover. I read that every week. Of course, I look at the New York Times uh, food section. I don't read all the articles. I'm not terribly interested in the recipe articles although I think the recipes of David Tannis are, to me, very appealing for whatever reason. Um, but I like to see what everybody's writing about restaurants. So I read New York Eater, I eat, read eater.com, um, Edible Manhattan, all, all of the local stuff. I check out Time Out now and then. Uh, and I also check out the sites of the LA Times and the San Francisco Chronicle and the Washington Post, just to see what's happening in those cities. And besides, surfing the web takes me away from writing. And so all day long, I'm, I'm doing 
that kind of thing in between. Surfing. Surfing the yes. web. There are countless food blogs, um, thousands upon thousands. Um, I was doing a little surfing last night and even found, you know, there are a lot of different lists of the best food blogs. I even saw a list of the best food blogs for January 2015. Uh, maybe there's a best <laughs> food blog of April 10th. Um, any, any blogs in particular that, uh, that you like? Well, I don't know <clears throat> what you call a blog. Let's is say a website. We'll say a websites. website. Yeah. I like uh, American Roots Kitchen, Michelle Kyle's blog. I like that very much. Um, I don't think there's any other that I follow unless there's a link from something like if New York Eater refers to one or or um, the Times or something. Then, I, but I don't. Uh, read too many of them regularly. Yeah. Well, just to talk a bit more about the role of the critic today, 2015, um, which has changed dramatically since, I guess, Craig Claiborne was quite trend-setting at the Times um, in an account that I've read. Um, I don't know if there's someone else who you would, would name as the, the key uh, figure in the beginning of American food criticism. Um, but you know, it really wasn't the field that it is today. And um, how do you feel about that? The, kind of the authority, the role um, today, given our obsession with food, perhaps the food critic is more important than the the filmmaker or the uh, you know the newspaper editor. Certainly. Well, I I don't think so. I think it's more important to the food industry. I don't think the role of the critic has changed at all, but the number of critics has changed. The pressure on one powerful critic, which usually was the New York Times with maybe second place for New York Magazine when that came along, that's changed now because there are so many voices. But I don't think the role has changed, which to me is to give people an idea of what to expect when they go to a restaurant. Do they want to go? Do they not want to go? Is it a new place? Is it a, a look back at an old place? So I, I think the role is the same, even though various media have changed. Do you have enemies in the food world? Yes, I'm delighted tell to us, say tell us. so. <laughs> What's that like? <laughs> it's terrific. <laughs> I once, not too many people quote Roy Cohn these days, but <laughs> he said something I've enjoyed. He once said in an article written by Ken Oletta, the scare power of me is simply terrific. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy to say that 32 years after I've left the New York Times, there still seems to be a scare power <laughs> of me. So, so that's kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> But um, no, I, I, I almost enjoy, I do enjoy getting a rise out of people. There's no question about that. I always did since I was a little kid. So I may couch things in a way that I know is going to make certain people very mad just to see if they're paying attention. <laughs> and this is part of why Mimi is a, a natural tweeter. <laughs> Uh, because you told me, you know, that you want to stir up controversy, and that's how you get attention. So, some that's tips true. for any tweeters out there. Now, um, so you have plenty of enemies, and you've always been a critic since you were little. Oh, uh, my Critical. whole family were critics. I mean, we would sit around the dinner table. My mother would make something. My brother would say, I don't like it this way. My father would say, well, it's pretty good. My mother says, I'm only, always going to make it this way. I mean, the, the conversation was the dinner plus my father's day at the wholesale fruit and produce market in Washington Market, talking about what came in for the day, what was good, what wasn't good. Uh, some of you may have read this or heard me say this many times before because it's in my memoir and in the book, but 
He would come home talking about what fruit and produce came in from around the United States that day that he handled. And he would talk about apples from the West Coast not being as good as apples from the East Coast. There weren't enough cold nights for them to develop flavor. He didn't like um, oranges from Florida. He preferred them from California, but grapefruit from Florida, not from California. So it was this constant between him saying, you know, those lousy apples came in from Washington State, and, and my mother talking about people she knew who couldn't make a plate of chicken soup. And <laughs> this was the whole thing. I didn't know there was such a role as a food critic, but I think it was sort of, it became sub, subliminal knowledge that you have to pay attention to what you're eating. Not everything is the same, it's a question of, discernment and comparison. And that's what I think is fun about critiquing a restaurant, is seeing consistency, seeing how they handle things, or shopping in a market. If there are three different varieties of tomatoes, I might buy one of each, because the fun is tasting and seeing the difference. Have you ever rendered a judgment in print, in public, and regretted it? Only to the extent that I never wanted to uh, create a hardship for someone. I would be very sorry if I felt I had to give a negative review that I knew would hurt. Uh, if I knew a restaurant was on the edge of going out of business, I didn't review it because they didn't, they didn't need the push. If I knew that in advance, and I couldn't always know. Uh, a couple of times I've had to change or, pu or publish follow-ups, but that was because in a few instances when I gave restaurants a very high rating, the chefs left that very day. They demanded much more money. <laughs> the owner said goodbye, and by the time people went out on Friday night, because my reviews ran on Friday, not Wednesday, in the weekend section. By the time people got there on Friday night, it was a different chef, so the next week, I would uh, publish a follow-up saying, the chef I reviewed next week is no longer there, you know, we'll do a follow-up. So, um, and I, you know, if, if a place was really nice, everybody was nice there and the food wasn't good, then you, you feel kind of sorry having to do it and you don't do it unless it's a well-known place. There's no point in giving an unknown restaurant a bad review because you're saying, don't go to this place you never heard of. So uh, that was really reserved for new places that had a great deal of publicity, old places that needed to be revisited. What about service? I want to share a, a pan of mine. Um, I am more often than not not happy with the service in decent restaurants. And I have a million different criticisms and I'm rarely satisfied. How about you? Well, I think it's harder and harder to get uh, people trained to serve. I think it's often the, the uh, fault of management who doesn't do enough training. And um, we, we really now have a different style of service, which I like very much. It's more egalitarian, um, <clears throat> much more normal and less pretentious than the old Swiss hotel and restaurant school. But of course we have new restaurants that don't have a following who hire inexperienced kids. It's very hard for a new restaurant to get good help because if the help is in a place where they, that's successful and they're making good tips, they don't want to leave for an unknown place. <clears throat> and one restaurateur told me once that after I gave her a three-star review, all kinds of waiters and captains began coming around for jobs because they realized there would be a crowd. So it works both ways. To me, the, the epitome is the Danny Meyer model. Uh, he seems to get it just right in terms of training and attitude. You know, it's not the Swiss hotel and it's not too egalitarian. Um, so restaurants are competitive these days. Uh, well, competitive with, always, with each other, but, always. but eating is competitive. 
And, and you've talked about that being different today than in the past. Um, the yeah, emphasis it was always, on the new. Always something about, you know, oh, I went to a new one. But now there are so many new ones so quickly that there is a certain cachet to, I have one friend, I don't think he knows what he's doing, but he has to be at every place first. And, um, you know, it's like one-upmanship. You get points. And, uh, in, in fact, the restaurant the might not. Because the press makes it hot. And because they have press agents who say, look what we're going to do, and this is what we're going to do. And then, when they do that, when they build it up, and a critic comes in early and gives them a bad criticism, they say, you came too soon. And I say, as soon as they charge full price, they are fair game. And, Sounds like there's a lot of agreement with that. And if they want a trial period, they should do what the Broadway theater does, is have discount prices for two months or whatever they think it's going to take to straighten it out. Also, not only do they charge full price, but many of them have press agents who have a one-year buildup of publicity to the place. They want all kinds of walk-up stories on the decor and their intentions I, I think too much attention is being paid to the goals of the chefs, what they are trying for, what they are, you have to understand what they're doing. You don't have to understand it, it's dinner. <laughs> and you know, whatever they're trying for on their way there, the food better be pretty good. It's not like uh, Picasso in a blue period and a rose period and so on. And uh, I, I read the reviews now, long introductions about the goals of the chef rather than the achievements of the chef. So, and, and the public's playing along, especially young eaters. They go in like, like it's a sport. Um, you know, well, you know, well, let's see, are they, you know, are they going to hit it out of the field tonight, and so on. So, another thing that has changed a lot in the New York City uh, eating scene is, are the, the kinds of restaurants in so many ways. Um, you mentioned to me something that I, I was grateful you brought up, um, th which is the decline in the number of Chinese food restaurants. And I want to tell you a story. Um, it's kind of a, a joke, a stereotype, you know, Jews and Chinese food, but I happened to be on the Upper West Side going to synagogue one Shabbat, and after service on Friday night, looking for some Chinese food, Natural. could not find <laughs> on the Upper West Side. No, there's now Red Farm, and that's a good one if you can get in on no, the Upper no West Side. <laughs> no, I'll, I went to this one and didn't. Love Chinese it. lost status. I mean, there are still, we know, plenty of little Chinese restaurants and takeout places. But in the 70s, it was a rage because we began to see the food of northern China. And after Nixon went to China, they allowed a number of chefs to come in and do demonstrations and work at restaurants for a little limited time. And we began to see cuisines other than the Cantonese, Sichuan, Hunan. And um, right now, it's uh, overshadowed, certainly, by Jap Japan for status and Southeast Asia. There are some reasons. Michael Tong of Shun Li has expounded on it. He said, for one thing, people, the young people who eat out and so on and who are busy, tend to order takeout Chinese often when they're eating at home. So they think when they go out, they don't want to eat Chinese again, never mind that it's different. And the other problem for a long time was getting Chinese cooks into this country from China. He said it was very, very difficult, and there was not a lot of talent around, as there was in Canada, for example, which welcomed talent during the Cultural Revolution when uh, chefs were fleeing China and were going to Singapore and Hong Kong and Taiwan and Canada that had, a, that had great prizes for them, developed great, great Chinese cuisine. And he said he would not know where to get uh, really good chefs from China and how to get them in. Many that we hear of now are Chinese Americans who were born here or say David Chang, who's doing sort of Korean Oriental, or uh, a Danny down at Mission Chinese. They didn't have to be imported here to do it. And they're doing a sort of inventive kind of 
Chinese, uh, as is Red Farm, and their, their restaurant, Decoy, where they do Peking duck, is very, very good, but it's not old-fashioned, um, I, I don't want to say authentic, but it's not the old style, but you know they've given it a modern look in the way it's presented at the table, but very good. And in terms of old, old fashioned and new fashion, you've noticed that trend in practically every cuisine, uh, French, yes. Italian. And fusion. fusion. I expect to see a big fusion of uh, Mexican, Latino, and Southeast Asian. I think it's a natural fusion because of so many ingredients, limes, uh, cilantro, hot chili peppers, so many things and so many looks that at the same, we may have faux taco, tacos pretty soon, or instead of a banh mi, the banh mi will be in a taco, but it'll be a banh mi filling, all the other way around. But I, um, I think, you know, that's a natural way to go. The, um, there's a restaurant in Brooklyn that does riffs on Southeast Asian, mainly Vietnamese, that's very good. It's called Nightingale Nine in Carroll Gardens. And he does very inventive things on Vietnamese with some Japanese touches like ramen. And for Korean, uh, uh, at uh, Han Jan, they do wonderfully contemporary presentations of Korean food. It doesn't look the way it looks on 37th Street and 38th Street. How do you like the food there, by the way, in Koreatown? Uh, on, oh, I like some of it very much. It's always too hot sitting at those braziers, but uh, I like it. But I like Hanjan better. Yeah. It's accessible in a, in a uh, much easier way, I think. Now, you mentioned, though, that you, you miss some of the kinds of restaurants that used to be around that are less around now. A certain kind of seafood restaurant, classic French. You mentioned neighborhood restaurants. Uh -huh. Tell us about that. Well, oh, I miss a lot of the really authentic French bistros that used to abound in the theater district on Ninth Avenue in the 40s and 50s. And I miss seafood restaurants like Seafood of the Aegean, where you would go in and they'd have all kinds of fish and you could have them broiled or poached or fried with very simple garnishes. I mean, if you really wanted fish, you could get it there. You can still do that at the Oyster Bar. And Aqua Grill, I must say, is very sensible in saying you can have any fish on this menu, broiled, steamed, or fried. And then they have them all in their fancy creation dishes, too. Um, in the village, I certainly miss the coach house, which was um, a really upper grade, very special, elegant, impeccable restaurant. It's where Babo is now, and I never go into Babo without wishing it with a coach house, <laughs> even though Babo makes some very good things. Um, and uh, Why did it close? Do you know why the coach house closed? Uh, the man died. Uh -huh. the, the owner died, and there was nothing else. He had no children who were in it, and um, I mean, it's not only, it's not always a tale of mean landlords. He owned the building, so he was not a you know, at the mercy of mean landlords. But then there were down here in the South Village many good Italian trattorie uh, run by the Italians who lived for the most part in the South Village. Um, and those have all gone. There's a, um, a sort of riff on it now at Carbone in what used to be my favorite Italian restaurant down here called Rocco's. And, and they're doing a kind of send up on Rocco's. But um, I don't think those simple places could have paid the current rents, even if uh, they uh, weren't driven out of business. I mean, Rocco's, again, the people got old and died. So there's nothing you can do about it. And you know, we've been involved in talking about how do you save a local business? What can you do? And sometimes you can't. Sometimes it's just the time isn't right for it. And uh, having been to every corner of the globe, um, as you have. Do you feel that the village, um, or you know, the village, downtown New York, New York, but especially the village, plays a particular role in the cuisine of the world? In the cuisine of the world, no. I would say in the style of New York, maybe yes. And some of those 
uh, cutting edge restaurants may open down here, but I don't think that's a function of the village. Uh, we have some, what I consider very successful and good uptown restaurants here that are not villagey, but I mean, Gotham Bar and Grill is a classic example of a very successful, excellent restaurant, but it's not a village restaurant in the way that maybe Barbudo is or uh, Da Silvano, which I still like very, very much. And Barbudo is leaving because of And it's rent. leaving because yeah. the building was sold and the new owner doesn't want them. And Pastis is, has left and is not coming back, which I think is a great loss. I agree. Um, well, Mimi, what's on your mind these days, uh, apart from all this stuff and apart from promoting your book? Um, any particular things chafing you or that you're curious about? Food. food. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> I'm good kind movies. of interested in getting to all the new places. I, I didn't always feel that way, but maybe and now that the book is done and I have a little more time, uh, some of them have sounded very interesting, and I must say I've gotten to Cosme, which I thought was disappointing, Upland, which I thought was spectacular, Narcissa, which I like very much. Uh, so uh, I am kind of looking for remnants of the old French bistro taste. And the place that has had it most for me recently is La Mangeoire. Their chef has left, but he's still consulting, and the sous chef who was under him has continued, and I must say I haven't been back, but I had some food there in the last two years that I thought really tasted the way the old French food used to taste. The aioli, the beef bourguignon, the, the roast, the coco van, uh, the pâtés, and, and they just went on doing it in that way. Couture's Beef has some of that, but it's, it's a taste. None of the new ones that call themselves new French bistros have food that tastes French to me. It may be very good, but my benchmark goes back to 1953 when I started traveling in France. Different generations have a, a different basis of comparison, so they may feel things taste French that I don't think taste French at all. What are the hallmarks of, of the taste? for you. That's hard to describe, but it's a texture, a pâté de campagne, it's a sort of slightly oily and let chewy, the breath of garlic and bay leaf and cognac, it's the way it feels when you chew it, and it's not so easy to find in France. In 50, from 53, let's say, to 65, any place you went in France, the croissants were great, the pâté de campagne was great. Then, uh, I once interviewed Yves Saint Laurent on food in France, and he put it well. He said, today, you need an address. And that was different. You didn't used to need an address to know Meaning where a, to a, get. a good address? The good or? thing. Oh. The address of a good place, because you couldn't just get it any place. So they lost a lot <clears throat> when they gave everything to the Nouvelle Cuisine. I think it cost France a great deal of its reputation. Sounds like maybe you'll, you'll bring it back. Bring, bring <laughs> well, the trend I, the met, other way. I met Bocuse after many years, and he said, Madame, you were right. So yeah. Yeah. that was a nice feeling. <laughs> Always a good thing. <laughs> so we probably have some, some students here or, or uh, working food critics or budding food critics. What, what advice would you give them? Don't get too fat. <laughs> How? How? Don't eat at all. <laughs> okay. and, and when you're not eating for work, don't eat or eat lettuce. I, I weighed 210 pounds when I left the New York Times. And it's taken many, many years to get to where I am. First, it took about three years to lose 30. Then I thought, OK, that's that. That's enough. Then five or six years later, I thought, maybe I ought to take off a few more. And every once in a while, I would do that. And um, do, you, uh, do you have a, a diet to recommend? Uh, low calories. <laughs> End of story. What's that? What, and what? End of story. End of story. OK. I thought you said something about celery. <laughs> so low calories. OK. Um, so that's one piece of advice. Don't get fat. Anything else? Um, well, it's, it's tough if you want to be a critic to find a place to be a critic. 
because uh, the jobs are hard to get. Fewer and fewer places want to pay the expenses of a critic. Uh, when they are trying to save money, they might cut out restaurant criticism. I think the Daily News did for a while. I don't know if they're doing it now, but it's a very, very expensive center, cost center, if you're going to do it right. And um, some publications, although not any I know in New York, are quite content to let their critics take free meals, which I think is the wrong idea. Uh, and many critics say, well, you know, it doesn't make any difference. What do they know? What difference does it make if they know I'm there? And it makes an enormous difference. Even if you come in unexpectedly, there are all kinds of things they can do. I once wrote an article for Vanity Fair on everything a restaurant could do when a critic suddenly appears, recognized but not expected. And I wrote this long article, and I had a call from a, a, an Italian restaurateur, Adi Giovanetti, who said, Signora, you don't know the half of it. <laughs> he said, we can do much more than that, especially if you order an appetizer. That gives us plenty of time to fix the main course. So. And you tell us about your costumes. You protected your identity. I didn't have costumes, but I had wigs. I, I wore regular clothes, but I had three wigs, and I had lots of eyeglasses with plain glass lenses, because I didn't wear eyeglasses, so nobody would expect that. And I used to put the wigs on in a cab. If I were coming from the office of the New York Times, I didn't even want the people there to see my wig, so I would put it on in the taxi going over. And I can tell you there is nothing as embarrassing as showing up in a wig and glasses and having someone say, good evening, Miss Sheraton. <laughs> because then you feel, what do I do? Like Superman, I go in a phone booth and take everything. Should I leave it on? Should I take it off? And gradually that began to happen. They began to re uh, recognize my husband. And I had, after seeing Serpico, I had some great ideas of what he could do, but, <laughs> but he wouldn't. And um, usually I, we were ate with four people, and I would have the other two people arrive first to see what kind of treatment they got at the door. The reservation was obviously not made in my name, uh, what kind of table they got. And I used to ask, in some cases, say that I would arrive a little late. Would they order an appetizer? So we would see what would happen in that. And I remember once at the Four Seasons, uh, I arrived just as my friends were being served rather dried out slices of smoked salmon. And when they saw me approach the table, they just wished the, the whole uh, Gerardon away and uh, brought a new one with a new salmon that they began cutting in the middle, which reminded me of my mother going to an appetizing store and if the uh, clerk brought out a new side of salmon, she would do that old Jewish joke thing. How much do you want? Cut. How much do you want? Keep cutting. And they would keep cutting. And then she would say, they would say, are you at the belly? And they would say, yes. And she would say, now give me a half from a quarter of a pound. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really true. They would do that. Uh, where were we? <laughs> So it's funny about costumes because part of it is, I guess, feeling self-conscious or foolish. And can you, do your taste buds work as well if you're adjusting your wig? <laughs> I didn't have to adjust it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And what, what, do, what do critics do today? You know, Adam Platt. They've New York given Magazine. up anonymity and they've announced it. I noticed Jonathan Gold, a great critic at the Los Angeles Times, he announced he was giving up trying to be anonymous. I think Pete Wells did. I think Adam Platt did too. It's, it's probably useless with uh, uh, selfies and, and, you know, the internet where a picture goes around. There were pictures of me in kitchens, but so rarely recognized. Uh, they weren't ready for it at the moment, or it wasn't the owner, the staff wasn't paying attention. Uh, I went to one restaurant called Hungaria, owned by George Lang, a great restaurateur, but he wasn't there every night. And I was given a terrible table near the kitchen door, and every time the door opened, I saw my picture on the wall. <laughs> 
in the kitchen, my husband sort of says, there's your picture. But nobody recognized me. The staff, you know, they didn't think she's not going to be here this night. You know, they feel that some kind of bell will go off to announce a critic is coming in. So very rarely recognized from a picture. But now I think it's different. And I don't know, I heard did Pete Wells grow a beard somewhere. I remember at one point Brian Miller grew a beard for a certain point so he wouldn't be recognized. Then he shaved it off so he wouldn't be recognized. So, Speaking of, of selfies and, and so many images on the web, um, how do you feel when the person at the next table is taking a picture of their plate and posting it to Instagram? I don't mind if they're taking a picture of a plate. I wouldn't mind if they were taking a picture of people around them and me. If they are people at my table doing it, I, it's a little more annoying in terms of you can't just eat. They want to take its picture. So I'm always there with the fork and they're saying, wait a minute, you know. Uh, restaurants don't like it. it. You know, it obstructs the service. It's unattractive. The food gets cold. But unless they pass a rule that you can't do it and therefore alienate some people, uh, people are going to go on doing it, at least for a while. It's a hot game right now yeah. to take a picture and, and send it around the world. A lot, of, a lot of pictures of carrots going around right now. Well, uh, fess up, do you ever enjoy those pictures yourself from your friends who say, I had this fabulous meal in Rome last night and here it is? Do I do you, do you enjoy those pictures yourself? Some pictures yeah. from friends who travel, especially people who are in the business and know I might be interested. My friend Tom Margatai, who used to own the Four Seasons with Paul Covey, we're still in touch, and he travels a lot uh, through the year, and especially to parts of Italy. And when he sees something interesting, he photographs it and sends it to me. But that's, that's helpful, and that's interesting and special. You know, so with a more description. Research. <laughs> more research than showing off. Um, so where, do you have a, a, a trip planned at no, the moment? No, I don't. Staying I close don't. to home. I'm yeah. very busy here doing things. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the one place I regret not traveling to for many reasons, including food, but mostly for other things about it, is the Silk Road. Uh, I've always found that to sound exotic and Samarkand, Tashkent, Bukhara. And some of that food is beginning to come here. So, uh, and I would love to have gone to what, Russian Georgia. And I'm, I must say there's a terrific restaurant in the village serving the food of Georgia. It's called Old Tbilisi Garden on Bleecker Street near Sullivan, and the food is just wonderful, and the place is very appealing. I haven't been to Oda House in the East Village, oh, yeah. which also does it, so I can't compare it. But when I traveled through Russia, the best food was Georgian food. Even though I didn't have it in Georgia, there were Georgian <laughs> restaurants in what was then St. Petersburg and, and Moscow and so on. Great. So we've ended on a few recommendations. I see Fabio wants to move us on to the wonderful reception and book signing. Thank you to Mimi Sheraton. Thank you all.